If you want to introduce your son, be happy to. Okay. I don't want to take from his testimony. No, no, but, no. Uh, we got plenty of time. We're not in any hurry. I'm going to get a chair and sit over here. Go ahead. Uh, Con has always had a personality that's been huge, and now he has a personality that's huge for the Lord. Uh, don't cry on me. You <laughs> make me cry. Go ahead, brother. Uh, Something that's come to my mind of recent is one of the greatest gifts we have from God is hope. Amen. Not just a hope for ourselves, you know, that we will someday be with Him, but it's that hope for others. And I think the foundation of that hope is that with men, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. That's what keeps us praying, that's what keeps us hoping. No matter how bleak things may look, we always have that hope. Yep. So here's an example of faith and my hope. Okay. Yeah. His real name, his full name is Harry Tom Kimber. After his grandfather. Well, I'm going to try not to get emotional, but... Please do. You're among friends. <laughs> I'm just very thankful for all the prayers. Amen. Amen. So, I really am because I know the power of prayer and he hears the prayers of the righteous. Amen. And I That's just, right. I'm very, very, very thankful that not only my parents, my wife, and just all of you guys, I'm just very, very thankful for that. Amen. So, with that being said, I have a very interesting story. It's, it's something where, to me, growing up, I think I wasn't planning on doing this, and, but in sharing my testimony, I thought it'd be beneficial to read Mark 6, 1 through 6. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, I don't know if I pronounced that right, and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense to, at him. Offense! Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wandered. He and he wandered at their unbelief. Yeah, yeah. Wandered. Jesus wandered. Yeah. He is amazed at their unbelief. Yeah. So the reason I, I read that is I was brought up in a Christian home with godly parents. I was somebody that saw day in and day out that my dad loved my mom but ultimately my dad loved god and because my dad truly loved god he knew how to love my mom and my mom loving god truly knowed how to love my dad and love us kids Amen. and the way i always saw church was just something that for me i was full of personality like my dad said I was very ADHD. <laughs> to sit in a church service and, and, and to listen and to sing hymns, I haven't sang a hymn and I don't know how long. And it was just a breath of fresh air because one of the things and since having this heart change is you listen to some of Caleb and, 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 the, and, the, and the music and the, the, the lyrics just don't align with what God Amen. and what the Bible says. Right. And it's something where I know what it says. But it's still very hard to listen to, to listen to that. So the hymns being so pure and, and, and illustrating the, the power of God and His love, and not only that, it's, it tells a story. To me, that was just something that was really great to experience. Yeah. But with that being said, I just found church to be very, very, very boring. <laughs> it was boring. Growing up as a kid, my parents wanted to go to church Sunday morning. Sunday night, and Wednesday. I mean, this just got ridiculous. I'm like, church is for Sunday, and, and leave it there. But not only that, they wanted to go to church and go to Sunday school. Yeah. 
and then go to church and then go to Sunday night church and go to Wednesday group. So for me going up, I understand why they wanted to do that. They wanted to be absorbed in the things of God. Amen. They love God, so they want right. to spend time with God. Why wouldn't you want to do that? But growing up, I just didn't want that. Now, I didn't really understand, but when I got to be a teenager and get into high school, I was somebody that only lived for the moment. I never thought about having good grades to go to college. I thought about living life right now, and I'm going to have fun. I was the class clown, and I just pray and thank God for my parents' patience. Amen. But I'll tell you right now, my parents always disciplined me. And I don't think people really understand, if you don't discipline your kids, you don't love them. That's right. I know my mom and dad loved me <laughs> because they disciplined me. And I actually, to be honest, is growing up as a kid, I didn't fear God, I feared my dad. <laughs> it was strictly the fear of dad. Man. <laughs> but that's not going to lead somebody to repentance. Yeah. That's just something for me, I knew if I'm going to do something wrong, I'm going to get it when I get home. Yeah. And my mom, bless her heart, she knew her strengths that she had to be patient. Because there's times where if she were going to punish me, she was going to go all out. And she just wanted to wait for dad. Because it's, it's, it's growing up, I was just somebody that, again, I was a nightmare. So how did this continue to carry after high school? Well, something for me, I was never considered, I'm being very honest here, growing up, I was not the one that attracted girls. I was somebody that was always in the friend zone. Con's a great guy, he's a great friend, and I kind of just always considered, you know, I was popular, I was well liked, I was good at sports, but my senior year I grew six inches. I got my braces off. I changed my hair. I started working out. All of a sudden I started getting attention. So what happened when I started getting all this attention? Well, that's what I lived for. So for me, I had a personality. People liked me, girls liked me, and this is what my idol was, was attention. So for me, the next five years, from the time I was about 20 to about 26, I just lived a life of six, seven nights a week of drinking. I just drank because for me, I found my worth in the bar scene. I found my worth in people praising me and wanting to be around me. I didn't have to wait in lines to get into bars. Owners wanted me. They put me in the back, get me, and free drinks. And this is the life that I lived, and these are the things that were happening. But what happens when you live in sin? So something my grandpa's been teaching me lately is sin has consequences. That's right. That's right. And it's not just, it, there's two types of consequences. Primary consequences and secondary consequences. So what happens is you continue to live in sin and you continue to drink. Well, I got a DUI. Now, who am I going to blame that on? <laughs> Nobody. Right. Myself. It broke my parents' heart. So what did sin do? Not only did sin catch up with me, the roosters came home to roost. Mm -hmm. I got caught. Yep. I had to pay the penalty for that. But then the aftermath is it broke my mom and dad's heart. They literally broke down crying. They know that they didn't raise me in this way. But here's the thing about God. Here's the thing about anybody. God doesn't cause anything. That's right. God can only influence us. That's right. Amen. My mom and dad can only influence me to love God. They can't force me to love God. Even Jesus couldn't even reach his own siblings. That's right. James eventually did. Mm -hmm. Praise God because they thank God for James. Faith without works is dead. That's right. To him that knows sin and does it anyways, to him that is sin, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, it's sin. Amen. It's very clear in James. But that wouldn't have happened if Jesus and James didn't change his ways. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, when I was 26, I just came to a point in my life that I was tired of the way I was living. I really was tired of it. I just, it it's a stressful way. When everybody says that they're no longer under the law and they're living in sin and they're not in bondage, it's a joke. Yeah. I said, they're the ones that are, are in bondage Amen. They, because they're not sinning boldly. Well, maybe some. It, but my point is, is if you don't turn and you're trying to be religious without actually loving God and having a heart for God, it's very difficult. Right. 
That's right. But what does the Lord say? My my burden is easy. My yeah. yoke is light. Amen. If your heart is to please God, it's very, very, very simple in the sense of obeying Him. Now, I'm not saying persecution and going out there and having conversations with people and then wanting to rip your eyes out. I'm not necessarily saying that's easy. It's uncomfortable. It's something that, but we're required to do that. So here's why I'm saying all this. I had an experience April 11, 2009. I truly repented. I truly turned away from the way I was living. And the way that looked like, to me at that time, there was a lot of things in my life that were too important. One being my looks. I remember going to mom and dad. I broke down like a baby. I literally just sobbed at the fact that Jesus was willing to still forgive me. That Jesus was willing to die for me. And I literally repented and turned away from the way I was living my life. Now, when I, when I read what it means to repent, it says, But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, and observes all my statutes, and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That's in Ezekiel 18.21. If you go to Ezekiel 18.30, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your Amen. transgressions. Amen. Does that say some? No. Nope. It says all your transgressions. So that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. That's ex truly what I experienced in 2009, April 11th. It was actually my grandma's birthday. And for the next six years... I truly lived a life where I was free from sin. But here's what I was doing in the beginning. I was digging in the Word. I was trying to understand the Word. But here's something where I'm just being very transparent to you. I thought I understood the Word, but I really didn't understand the Word. Meaning, I knew what it means to have and to love God. I truly loved God for those six years of my life. But the problem is, is, as I was going out and speaking, I was convicted. I mean, I had not a lot of wisdom. I was very argumentative. Now, I'm not saying that this is not coming from a righteous place. But there is things that you have to have wisdom in reaching out right. to people yeah. and trying to reach the lost. You can't just sit there and jump down their throats. You can't. And I, and I read Scripture and understood Scripture for what I saw it and what it meant. But the thing that is, is I was doing this, I was in constant turmoil. Constant. It was nonstop. Just arguing, arguing, arguing. So for me, what ended up happening is, is after six years of this, here's how intense I was. I read the pamphlet, Who Shall See God, probably a dozen times. I understand what the heart is, only the pure in heart shall see God. That means outward actions like the Pharisees, though they're living to the letter of the law, they're wicked in their hearts. Right. You can't, it's a very stressful way to live your life that way. But for me, I didn't understand really of what some of, here, I'm, here's what I'm trying to go with this. I didn't endure. Mm -hmm. I did not endure. For me, the arguments, I used to hand who shall see God pamphlets to girls that claim to love God. I wanted to be in, in a relationship. I wanted to be married. In the first year of my life, I shaved my head. I didn't date for a year. I said, if I don't love God, I don't know how to love a woman. Why am I going to date? Why am I going to pursue that? I need to get my, right, my life right. And I, I did those things. I did those extravagant things because I wanted to. Not that, that I felt like I had to or it was required. I did it because it was too important in my life. So as I was making all these changes, I was going out there and I was just constantly in arguments and I was always hitting a brick wall. I'm like, why is this happening? So what did... What do you think started to happen after this continually would happen? I started to not doubt, but I, 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 I got tired of it. I didn't want to be in turmoil anymore. I didn't want to constantly be arguing. I was lonely. I only had my mom and my dad. That's it. I felt like they were my only friends, and this is what my life's going to be like. I'm never going... To, now, again... I had friendships, but they were just superficial because they weren't living intently 
for what I understood God to be. And I'll tell you, here's what I know about God. You're either a good tree or you're a bad tree. That's right, amen. And there is no middle ground. Right. So what I'm about to say broke my parents' heart more than I think even I can fathom. But I made a choice. And what started to happen is I wasn't spending as much time in the Word. I wasn't seeking God like I was the first year, or the second year, the third year, fourth year. It was more about, I'm just trying to win arguments. I felt like my heart, and even though from what I knew, I was living obediently, I think what I was trying to accomplish was not even giving glory to God, but I wanted to win arguments. I wanted to reach people, but I just didn't understand who God really was, and I didn't understand the scriptures fully. So because of that, I, I literally, I remember, it was around March or April of 2015. I walked away from God. I walked away from God. But here's what I mean when I walked away from God. I said to God, I'm no longer going to follow you, and I'm willing to go to hell. I am willing to go to hell. I want that to register. I literally was so tired and so fed up of where I was at and, and just hardened my heart towards things that I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't. And I walked away from God. So people tell me, well, well, well you're still, people like to tell me, well, you're yeah. still saved. Yeah. You yeah. still love Jesus. Yeah. You still, faith. My faith didn't change. The devil had faith. But the faith doesn't mean anything. Right. Faith without works is dead. Right. And I knew that. Yeah. So I was willing to walk away from God. But I also know it says in the Word. It says, those that walk away after experiencing and seeing yeah. the light, it's very, very difficult yeah. to come back. Amen. So what did I do? I went and lived the way I wanted to live. And here's what's crazy. My parents... Again, I broke their heart again, but at that at that time I did not care. I really didn't. I loved. I understood what love was, but I decided I'm not just going to dibble dabble. I'm out. And through all that, I started drinking again. I had victory in drinking for six years. It's not even a temptation. It was. It's not like oh, I wake up every day, man, I'm struggling. I see a bottle. Can't go to a restaurant. See booze. No, I died to that. Died to the flesh. That turned. Because now I wanted to do what I wanted to do, so I started drinking again. I started finding my worth in the way I looked, my physique, and working out. I loved all the attention. I just started living for the world, started doing the things that I wanted to do again. But here's the thing, guess who I met? Now this is what's really crazy about the power of God. I met my wife, who was back there with my two kids. But here's how this all transpired. It was seven years. I first met my wife, she was, she didn't really, she, she was brought up in a, in a Christian home, but for her and I, we, we met in, in circumstances where we wanted to drink and party. I also, during that six years, obviously wasn't having sex, because again, I was really living for God, I want you to know that. My heart was right, and I had victory in that, but I didn't endure, didn't endure the rapes, I turned, it even says right here, and um, Ezekiel 18, 24. But when a righteous man right. turns away from his righteousness, yep. commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? Yep. All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered for his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed. For him he will die. That's right. Does it get any plainer? No. Nope. I walked away, but I knew that. But here's what ended up happening. My parents ended up finding out that me and Brittany were being inappropriate in our relationship, doing things that we shouldn't have, and they found out. And it devastated my parents. They essentially gave me an ultimatum, but I already knew where my heart was at. They said, you either choose Brittany, and, and you're not going to be living under this house, or you don't pursue Brittany. And this is only after six weeks of knowing Brittany. What do you think happened? I left my parents' house and I moved in with my girlfriend in six weeks. And just so you know, I never lived away from my house for longer than three months. And I was 32 years old. 
So for me to, 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 to walk away, here's essentially what I'm saying. I walked away, I moved in with her, and for about two years we were continuing to live in sin. We ended up getting engaged, we ended up getting married. Um, I got married on December 7th, 2019. 18, yes. Sorry. Thank you, Kathy. And we got married. And then I had Braylon. So we weren't planning on having kids. That was, that was something that was an accident. It's something where this is where I'm going to start getting more emotional is thinking about my little girl. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, as we got pregnant, we found out we were going to get the gender reveal, and before that, we had the, the ultrasound, and we found out that she had a heart defect. Mm. You want to talk about something that's difficult, especially if you're not in a relationship with God, it's knowing that you're a little girl, you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Well, through all that, you can see her back there. She's being a very good little girl right now. <laughs> Thank you, Grandma. She likes us. But she's a little too old. I prayed, but I knew God wasn't listening because I knew my heart wasn't right. But you guys were all praying. Yep. And I know God had a plan for my little girl. And with that being said, what do you think started to happen to my wife? My wife knew about a year before even having her, she wanted to start pursuing God. We started going to state line. It was painful for me to go to state line. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to be there, but my wife did. So there are ways that I was being superficially a good husband. I'm not saying I wasn't a good husband to a degree. But with that being said, she started wanting to pursue righteousness. Well, guess who also started coming around when, when, when Braylon was born? First of all, she was healed. I believe my daughter Amen. was healed. That's right. They literally said that what, when she was born, they thought that her oxygenation levels were going to be in the 60s and they are going to have to be given a catheter to then have a procedure to open that up so they would even be able to have surgery. When she was born, her oxygen levels was in the 90s. We were going to have a home birth also. But my point is, is I truly believed within three days of life, she had surgery and six days went home. Praise the Lord. They said that was the fastest we've ever had somebody that's had that procedure and left our hospital. Amen. I know that was God answering yes. yes. your yes. guys' yes. prayers. I yes. know 100%. So my heart at that time was starting to soften. Yeah. But what wasn't being changed yet? I still wasn't willing to pay the cost. Yeah. I was still wanting to live the way I wanted to live. But because of my daughter, what happened to my wife? My wife's got a very beautiful story, and I'm, I'm, she, I know someday we'll share it with you guys. My wife is unbelievable. I don't deserve I don't deserve her. I don't. And with her, is my parents, I didn't really have a relationship with them for those four years because I didn't want to be around them. But it, for me, it was just, it was superficial, but having that little girl just started to soften me, and, we, and, and Brittany wanted to start going to church, and so we started going to church. We started getting in table groups, but this is what's so powerful about God. This is what needed to transpire in Brittany's life, but guess who Brittany also had as, as, as an influence? She was around my parents a lot. My dad does not, my mom and dad do not shy from the church. Yeah, amen. They don't. And when Brittany would say something or, you know, and she was confused about something that was being said, my dad and mom, out of love, would instruct her. That stuck with Brittany. That, that if she would read and she would dive into it, she, she wanted to start learning a little bit more. So all of a sudden what was starting to transpire as Braylon was born is she started to modify her behavior. Well, when somebody modifies their behavior... Well, guess who it's then brushed off on? Right. Well, now she wants me to modify my behavior. <laughs> well, I don't love God, and I don't claim to love God. I don't want to modify my behavior. I want to drink. I want to do that thing. I want to every day. I didn't every day because there's consequences by being married to my wife. I still had to do things even though I didn't want to do. 
But how long did that last? I tried to give it up for a certain time to get in shape. Well, that didn't last. It's not motivating. You don't have the right heart towards stopping drinking. So in my life, drinking was still very important. So here's where I'm trying to go with this. Is we started getting involved in Stateline. I'm very, very thankful for Stateline. And when we were starting to go to Stateline, Brittany was changing. She was starting to change. I changed as a person because of having a daughter. And I was doing the best I could to truly love her, but I knew I didn't truly love her. I knew I didn't truly love my wife. So with that being um, transpiring, we then had Brooks. But this was also an accident. It, I'm very fertile, I guess. And so is my wife. And I thank God that we had Brooks as well. And in all this, we started, as she was getting pregnant, she also enjoyed to drink, but she wasn't drinking because she was breastfeeding and pregnant for all. You know, because they're only 19 months apart. So Brittany, some of the things that she wanted to do, she wouldn't do because she couldn't because she was pregnant and breastfeeding. But I was still in, engaging in these things. But as this is going on, we joined a rooted group. And in this rooted group, Brittany was studying. Brittany was reading. She asked me, she goes, why aren't you, like, I participated, I'm telling you friends, it's the most painful thing in the world because I, my, my pastors and the people in my life group, I was explaining what I was dealing with, and they're saying, it's okay, God still loves you, you're still saved, you're still a Christian, it, it's all good, it, His grace is enough, He became the second Adam, He sees you as righteous, just have faith. Didn't, didn't connect with me, I couldn't read scripture, I was just going through the motions, just, just, this is what the pastors are telling me. And I know that this is not true. I know that this is not, because I knew I had experienced it. But I still wasn't ready to change. But guess what I'm so thankful for? My wife was living to the light that she has been Amen. shown. That's right. That's the difference. She hadn't been brought up. She brought, was brought up in a home like that. But the way I was brought up, I knew what the truth was. I had experienced it. I walked away from it. I could never, she wanted to understand. I tried to help her and my group understand that I can't read scripture any different way. I can't think I'm okay and I'm a Christian. I'm going to hell. And they, my pastors just looked at me like I'm just, I'm nuts. <laughs> just, just absolutely crazy. No, you're not. No, you're not. I just, again, so here's what's happening. My wife is searching. She's growing. She's starting to understand things. She's starting to get more passionate about it. She's wanting to talk to my parents about it. She's wanting to read. She's listening to Francis Chan. She's just she, like, and then I have to sit there and listen to it. It's it, it just, just painful, painful for me. But I'm so very thankful because here's what, here's what ends up transpiring that, which is she, with having Brooks, she was continuing to make these changes, and it was starting to affect my life. It was going to start affecting my marriage, because she was getting more and more serious about the things of God. But, and I knew the light that she was being shown, that she wanted to please God. But I don't think she truly understood it yet. And here's what I mean by that. But when somebody's getting more serious, and they're getting more convicted, what do they do to the spouse? Mm -hmm. They put that conviction on you. So now this is happening, and while this is happening, I'm like, I'm getting annoyed. I don't like this. I don't want to change who I am. But my wife is making a change. She is starting to get more and more serious for the things of God. She always wants to talk about the things of God. She always wants to read. She's seeing that I'm not reading, that it's not serious to me. I try to help her understand that I, don't, I can't read. I know what the Bible says. I don't want to do it. <laughs> so why am I going to do it? I'm not going through the motions. I'm not. But as she continued to change, the Lord started working on me. Amen. I started to engage in things, and I had some habits that I then started to, to, to engage in with myself, and I would feel guilty, but I'd do it the next day. But my point is, is, I started to pray. I started talking to God. Even though I'm still knowing that this is wrong, and I'm not forgiven, 
and my heart's not right, I was still being pricked. Amen. It started to prick me because I started to soften. I started to see my wife change. I started to change a little bit more, even though the motives weren't right. I started to, you know, I see my kids. I want to be a good dad. I want to love my daughter. And then here's what ended up transpiring. With my wife wanting to change, and I hope this is not too long. I know I'm kind of going on a rabbit trail. I'm just, there's a lot to, to share with. My wife being the way she was, I was attending state line. And this was about, I would say, sometime in December, maybe first week of January, there's a, there was a situation at our church. And I know you guys are aware of it. Um, his name is Lance. And he is front and center at state line. And to me, that, that bugged me. It really, really bugged me in the sense of, I understand what God says, I understand what the pastors believe, and that, but allowing that yeah. to, ha to, to go on, it, it, it frustrated me. It irritated me. To the degree that I was even talking to my mom and dad about it. And I wanted to have a conversation with the pastor about it, even though I know I'm not living right. But here's what my dad said. He goes, Con, who are you to go talk to the pastor? <laughs> take the log out of your own eye. Yeah. To take the speck out of your eye. Well, my dad can say that out of love because my dad's living obediently. Amen. And with that being said, that situation at Lance really got to me. And what do I mean got to me? It started making me reflect on who God is. But remember, because I had Braylon, I started praying. Because of the things that were going on in my life, I was starting to feel convicted. I started leaning towards God. But just because those things are happening, if you don't commit to God, it That's doesn't right. mean anything. That's right. So as these things were transpiring and these things were happening, it started to do a work in me. I didn't know it, but I also knew that here's, what, here's where I had to then... There's my little guy, there's my wife. It doesn't bother us, it doesn't bother you. No. I started evaluating my life again. Knowing that my wife was making these changes, I knew if I didn't start changing some of the things I was doing, I was going to get caught. I was going to start doing things and start getting more bold with my sin. And it was only going to progress. And I already know how it was affecting our relationship. I know the things that I was doing. And with those things, they have consequences. Right. Sin not only hurts yourself, it hurts your wife, it hurts your kids, it hurts your, 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 your parents, it hurts your brother, it hurts your sister, it hurts your co-worker, it hurts your friends. That's the wickedness of sin, the deceptiveness of sin. Sin is very deceptive. So with that being said, I had a very... I started thinking about my relationship with God and how it wasn't there. But well, here's where fear entered my life, er, er, entered my mind. Because again, I love my wife. She was pursuing the things of God. But what had I experienced before? I knew what it meant to love God. If I make this change, and if I turn my ways from where I was at to where I need to go to be in right standing with God, is my wife going to be able to handle that? Yep. That is the question I had to answer. And I was wrestling with it because I was terrified. I know if I make this decision and she's not on the same page. So here's the, here's the situation. Over here, I'm sinning. I'm trying to modify it. She's getting more serious about the things of God, so I'm in a pickle. Okay? Now I'm over here thinking about actually getting right with God, not knowing if my wife's going to believe the same way. could still affect my marriage. I'm in a pickle. So I had a choice to make. So this is where I was battling. I was battling with God. But here's what God does. It's very interesting. He started to hear my prayers, I think, because Amen. he started to see my heart change. Right. Now he's like, okay, now I can work with you here. Now I can start, now I can start seeing what's going on here. 
Now, and as he does that, what, what happens? When somebody starts to change, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It starts to convict more and more and more. And here's what ended up happening. I said, you know what? My wife is unbelievable. I said, I truly believe with the light that she's being shown that she loves God. I said, but God, do I believe that she can get right with God and really understand the things of God? I said, I do. But I'm not worried about that anymore. I fear you. And friends, I cannot begin to tell you that I got right with God again. Amen. And it was in the first week of February. And what ended up happening is on my birthday, I got drunk with my father-in-law. had friends over, and I just see the things and how he was acting. <clears throat> it bugged me. It wasn't just, I wasn't accepting of it anymore. I said, this is weird. Next day, my parents were going to come over to the, to the ranch. I'm telling you right now, I love the ranch. That's where I used to party with her, with her dad. He doesn't love God. And I used to throw down, and that's, that was like, that was my release. That was like, I just, I looked forward to the farm so much so I could just live the way I wanted to live. I went there that day. You know, when my parents were coming over, Alan said, hey, do you want to have a drink? I said, no. I still hadn't made that choice yet. But that was the first time in seven years that I was not tempted to drink. I was like, something's going on here. <laughs> and I started to evaluate my relationship with the Lord started working on me. And with that being said, I repented and I turned away. I found my way back home again. But I'm telling you right now, I don't think that would have happened if you guys weren't praying for me. Amen. But here's where I now see and understand grace. Titus 2, 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good Amen. works. Amen. What I've been learning, through, so here's what I'm going to pat me. What does repentance mean? Change, change your mind, change your heart. Reconcile yourself. It's not a one-way street. That's right. You have to do something. Amen. You have to reconcile yourself That's to right. God and come to God. Amen. That's the reason for the cross. Jesus didn't become sin. He bore our sin. That's right. Amen. We must do something. We need to change. I, I get frustrated sometimes when people think about grace and that they can just continue to live on sinning, right? Well, the other day, I don't know if some of you are following me on Facebook. I'm getting very passionate because <laughs> I'm starting to understand the other side. I, I never did that the first time I got right with God. I'm sorry, I never understood what imputed righteousness meant. I didn't realize that people think that our sins paid for. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize any of these things and understand Calvinism. I didn't understand any of that. My point is, is this is what Hebrews says about our great sacrifice that Jesus did. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29 says, For if we go on sinning willfully Amen. after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Amen. The sacrifice means nothing right. if you're continuing to live in sin willfully. Yep. It's gone. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot in the Son of God and is re regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has resulted or insulted the Spirit of grace? I don't think there's more. I mean, the, the, the Bible's full of powerful scripture. That's, that's, but that one right yeah. there, you cannot. That's right. You cannot. It, it, I don't know how somebody can say, oh, that's not true. It's right. It's right there. Mm -hmm. But here's where the rubber meets the road for me. The hardest part for me, because when you get reconciled to God, guess what you also have to do? You have to get reconciled to others. That's right. Friends, I will tell you, I've been alive for 39 years and four months, five months almost. What I'm about to tell you was the hardest decision I've ever made in my life. I love my wife. I know I'm getting right with God. 
I know I'm going to be a good dad. I know I'm going to be a good husband. But I was praying to God, because here's what's happening in my life right now, this time around. I'm using wisdom. I'm not here to win an argument with people. I want to reach people. I am studying these, these theologies that are being taught. I listen to my grandpa every day. <laughs> At night, me and Brittany spend time listening to my grandpa two hours a night. I want to carry on his legacy. I know that's big shoes to fill. I want to strive to that. But as I was making this change, I knew there were some things that I was ashamed of. And even though I was forgiven of, I knew I needed to tell my wife the things that I was doing. It took me three and a half weeks. I kept praying. Here's what I was praying. Holy Spirit, be with me. Because what I'm about to unload on my wife, I don't know if she can handle it. I pray to all, I, give me wisdom. I want to be smart and do this. I want to do this. I want to do it in your time. I know it needs to be done. And I pray for this for a couple weeks. And then I was on the couch. And I prayed that again. I kid you not. It felt like somebody took a blow dryer with my blood and was just radiating. I mean, I could just feel it. There was no denying that. And in that moment, I had a decision to make. God, I guarantee, I, I believe God was testing me. I know he was testing me. All right. I know you're saying you love me. I know you're getting right with me. All right. Now it's time to tell your wife. That's right. That's right. You get up. You be obedient. And you tell her. I was obedient to him. But here's what was terrifying to me. I know the, the light that my wife had been shown. She sees all the changes in my life. She's getting excited. There were things that she was starting to understand, but not truly understand. Alcohol to me, no issue anymore. She still said, well, well, babe, isn't it okay if we just had a drink? You know, for her and what she was believing. I said, it's all about the heart. Right. For me, I don't do it. If you want to have a drink, you can have a drink. I'm not. But then she started to, started to question things. Well, if I'm not going to have it at the house, why am I going to have it with my friends? So I could start to see that she was starting to understand things. But I don't know if she was going to truly see that it's not about the outward acts, it's about the heart. And if you love God, you're not going to desire the things of the world. I'm not saying to have eight drinks bad, but it's the heart and intent behind Amen. it. So here's what ended up happening. I stood up that day. I walked down. I sat down with my wife. But here's what's going through my head. I am scared, Lord, that my wife is not going to be able to accept what I'm about to tell her. I truly believe that she could not forgive me. I truly believe that she may not get over this. That this could end up affecting my marriage. And I have two beautiful kids that I love more than anything. I was terrified. I didn't want to lose my wife. I loved her. Don't want to be away from my kids. Amen. But I love God more. Amen. Amen. I feared God. That's right. And from that, I got up there. I just exposed everything. And at first she was understanding, and then it got real difficult for her. Yeah. I knew it would. She just needed time. She had to pray and work it out. But I was praying, and my dad and mom were praying that she would have hard for God to change. But I love God more than I love my wife. Yeah. <laughs> it was so difficult. Yeah. At that time, I did not want to lose my wife or my kids. And from that, the next day she was having a horrible time, just a hard time. She didn't feel like she knew me. She didn't know who I was. She was pulling and grasping with it, going from anger to, to praying for understanding to help forgive me. And she wanted me to take my daughter, go to my parents. They remember I was worried with my wife. But again, I had to make it right. Amen. Yeah, trust God. Yeah. And talking to them and, and, and going through this and admitting the guilt, the things that I was doing, she was not aware of in our whole marriage the whole time we were together. 
I just had this peace though. I was like, my mom and dad are like, I think she, I think it's gonna be okay. I think yeah. it's gonna be okay. I, I thought like it would be okay, but at the same time, I'm terrified. I'm terrified, friends. That's where it says, if you lose your life, you're willing to gain it. Yep. Lose it, you'll gain it. Well, here's what ended up transpiring. I was praying before I got home that the Lord would give me wisdom in what to say to my wife. Because I knew that we were going to have to have a conversation following this up. And here's what ended up happening. Here's why my demeanor is changing. I spoke to her for two hours. I really believed it was the Lord speaking through me. Amen. I believed the Lord was softening my, my wife's heart. I believed that she was starting to understand things. But here's what was the result of this statement that I think was moved and was from God. I said, Brittany, here's what I want you to realize. If I didn't truly love God, and I truly wasn't over these things, do you think I would have came up right. to you and sat down and told you? Right. Or do you think I would have kept hiding it? Mm -hmm. I would have kept hiding it. I said, do you realize how terrified I am to, to, to tell you that? But here's what I want you to know. That was the first act that I have ever shown you out of love. That ruined my wife. That wrecked her. That statement right there. She knew it. She understood it. When I said that that is the first act of showing love towards you, that softened and changed my wife's heart. I'll tell you right now, friends. You know what she did the next day? First of all, we hugged, we embraced. Remember when I said I used to hand out the pamphlet, Who Shall See God? Mm -hmm. I want this type of godly wife. And guess what I have? I have that wife now. Mm -hmm. I have her. She is the most godly, loving woman. I don't deserve her. She's the best mother. It wouldn't have happened if I didn't get right with God and I didn't have that conversation. Amen. But I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking, well, I need to do this. I need to make this right with God. The next day, I go away for a second. She comes home. She's got bags full. Our old weed that we used to smoke. The, the booze, gone. She chucked it. She's not, her heart changed. She started to see God. She started to be shown light. She started to research. We see eye to eye. Amen. We are now able to have a relationship <laughs> and understanding and a love towards each other and love our kids the way God intended. Amen. So, the Lord has done a work in my life, but that moment right there was the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. But because you're willing to lose your life, you'll gain it. Amen. So with that being said, I have gotten right with God. I know I kind of went all over the place today. I just pray, Lord, I, I just, I'm so very thankful for everybody here. And now I get to live life with my wife, but I also know that Continue to seek Him, continue to seek, continue to have that fervor, and I'm just going to now spread the good news, and I found my way back home. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, folks, you don't hear testimonies like that very often, do you? You get all this little Polly want a cracker Christianity instead of real transformation, right? Amen. Well, Josh, how quick can you make your little testimony? I can get it done. All right, there you go. So this is my son, who was raised in a similar home as Khan, a Christian home. And so he's had something happen in his life this week. Well, the way I differ from Khan's story is I've never been a Christian in my entire life. And there's only one reason for that. It's based in pride and selfishness. But I started doing something when I was in my preteen years that I'm sure you, every one of you can imagine what that act was. And over the years, I just continued to do that act of immorality. And because of my pride and and not wanting to be embarrassed to admit that that was my sin that 
all my other sin was built on. I, uh, I never gave my life to the Lord, even though there were various times where I was very close. I would never do what Khan did, which is admit that final thing that was your most embarrassing sin. So that's been my whole life, that particular immorality in my life um, was why I, I wouldn't turn to God. What changed is um, when I met Megan, we discussed things about that particular area of morality and I lied to her and we got married. And I was continuing to hide that sin and the fact that I wasn't a Christian at all and she thought I was over our entire marriage. But I watched her grow in God throughout our marriage. I come to this church, I listen every Sunday, so I know the truth. But I was never willing to admit that one area of my life. So then when I got a little bit sick and a little bit down, and I, I guess that started kind of breaking me down mentally a little bit, I still turned to God even though I, I, I don't know why I did, but I prayed to Him and begged Him for help when I was not sleeping. And, but in the back of my head, I, to myself, I'm like, what, what do you think he's going to do for you? You're not following him. You're not pursuing him. You refuse. You know, you know, that little thing in the back of the head of why I wouldn't change was always there. But then I just picked up the Bible. Megan was reading the Bible. I sat down next to her. She left and went to work. I just picked up her Bible and opened it. <laughs> And it said, go pray to God in the secret place. And I was home alone. So I just turned around and kneeled down and started praying. First it wasn't praying for salvation. I just, I don't know, I don't really know, but I just know that God started. It's like my life went before me. And it's like, Literally, I've wasted because I was too embarrassed, because of my pride. I could have changed when I was 15. I could have changed when I was 20. I could have changed when I was 21. But I just kept stacking, making it worse and worse and worse as I knew more people, as I, you know. But God just said, admit it. Tell who you need to tell. If you really want to become a Christian because at that point I'm starting to beg because I'm realizing I need to give my life to God but it's like he put a spotlight he knew he, he's known my whole life what I wouldn't admit and so I just said okay I'm gonna admit it to the person that's gonna be the hardest to admit it to which is my wife that I love and so I just prayed and begged God for his forgiveness. I probably didn't use the same amount of wisdom as you did to tell my wife, but I just felt mm -hmm. like a laser beam was in my head. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't tell her that day, mm -hmm. I may have not. I was too scared. There were times in my life where I said, I will go to hell before I admit to anyone what I've been doing my whole life and you're obedient then I said no I'm gonna I'm gonna tell him so I gave my life to God for the first time in my life for real everything's out on the table I haven't hidden anything and it is the most amazing thing on the world to have 40 years of, of 
lies to be gone. Mm -hmm. Praise God every day that Megan has forgiven me. Same exact thing. Absolutely amazing person, Christian woman, and I, I don't deserve you. But I'm going to spend the rest of my life hoping to change that with her and support her and I mean I, I, I am a changed person and I am going to put others before myself and my wife is the most important person for me on this earth than my children than my family and then others and uh, that's what I'm going to do and I would appreciate your, your support, your prayers, your your guidance, your input, if you see something in me, come talk to me. Because I've asked the Holy Spirit, and many times he's, he, I feel his poke. Uh, it's very hard to, to instantly change certain aspects of your personality. One of mine is embellishment. And so in a, just a normal conversation, I could embellish something, and it's amazing how the Holy Spirit, hey, what, are you, what was that? And I've had to tell Megan in the middle of a conversation, <laughs> like, wait a minute, that was, that was not real. I don't know why I did that, but I was wrong, and I'm sorry. So I um, continue to read this, this scripture, pray every day, uh, fellowship with my wife, reading the scriptures together. And um, if you have something in your life that you're hiding, it's not worth it. A little bit of embarrassment and breaking down of your pride, that's nothing. That's nothing compared to getting right with God. Amen. Amen. Just do it. Yep. I'm telling you from a person who spent 40 years hiding stuff, just do it. Spring. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, you probably didn't expect that when you came to church this morning, did you? That's all right. This is what we need to hear. Amen. God's still in the transformation business, isn't he? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So. You go and make sure today you're right with God. Because remember, in between you and some other person, it's between you and God. And you can only fix you, right? You can't fix anybody else. You can only fix you. So, praise God. Let's close in prayer.